The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me and your copy of Holy Scripture to the 64th chapter of the prophet Isaiah. <coughs> Isaiah chapter 64, we'll be reading verses 1 through 9 there this morning. Isaiah chapter 64, beginning with verse 1. O comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term and that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I say, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, and the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Lord, may you be with us as we hear now from your word. Speak to us, that your words may change us, and Lord, whatever words I may place in the way would be quickly forgotten. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I should tell you, it's Isaiah 40, not 64. That was just to see if you were paying attention. Today is the second Sunday of Advent, as we've already mentioned, a Sunday when we reflect upon the theme of peace. But peace is, is one of those words that we toss around a lot this time of year, I think, right along with words like hope, joy, and love. We speak about Jesus being the Prince of Peace. We sing songs about angels proclaiming peace on earth. And some churches and some folks even set aside special times and services to pray, especially for peace. Yet in spite of our best efforts to sing such songs, to pray such prayers, or to make such proclamations, peace has not yet come to our world. There continues to be unrest and conflict around the globe and even here at home. Nations struggle against nation. Political parties fight against other political parties. Religions are rife with division even among their own ranks and throw theological and sometimes literal bombs at one another. Racial tensions seem to be the highest they've been in over a generation. And the threat of nuclear war has once again come back to rear its ugly, destructive head. It seems peace is still elusive. That peace may be little more than just a word. Of course, peace does not happen on its own. Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers, not blessed are the peacekeepers, not blessed are the peace observers, or blessed are the peace waiter honors. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. It just doesn't arrive on its own it takes preparation, laying the groundwork for understanding, conversation, and reconciliation. And those things themselves are not easy. 
where one doesn't just pick up the phone one day to call a lifelong enemy and say, hey, look, I know we've been threatening each other with violence our whole lives, but how about you and I get coffee and bury the hatchet? You don't do it that way. Peace doesn't come so easily. But then again, nothing in life worth having, worth holding on to, comes so easily. Freedom, for instance. For over a generation, the people of Judah had gone without freedom. In the year 597 B.C., the Babylonians captured Jerusalem, and their king Jehoiachin was deported along with many of the elites of Judah to Babylon. And a decade later, amidst more and continuing conflict and strife, the city would be destroyed, its walls pulled down, its temple burned, its Davidic line seemingly ended, and more and more of its people exiled to Babylon. The people would remain in exile until around the year 538 B.C., when the Persian king Cyrus would conquer Babylon and allow these exiles to return to their homeland. If it's something you find interesting, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, that's what they're all about. The exiles returning to Jerusalem. But it's into this atmosphere of expectation, this apparent arrival of answers to prayers, that the prophet who most scholars call Second Isaiah speaks. These prophets, uh, this prophet's words are aimed at a people who have longed for freedom, longed for restoration, but they've yet to receive it. There are words that when we hear them initially, they ring with, well, they ring with relief. Comfort, O oh, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Preach to her that she has served her term. Her penalty is paid. She has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The first words from this prophet, the second Isaiah, they're words of commissioning to speak words of comfort to the people because they've paid their debt. Their sentence has been served and now God is releasing them from punishment and captivity. But this prophet knows, the prophet knows, however, that you just can't show up you just can't show up and tell folks who've been waiting for years that everything is fine now and you can go home. You don't just show up after a generation and say, okay, you've served your time, now you can go. You don't just open the doors of the prison and expect the prisoners to walk casually out without being a little suspicious. This prophet understands that a people who have been held in captivity for this long will likely be gun-shy, skeptical not only of the prophet but of the God for whom the prophet speaks. It's why the prophet says later on, all people are grass. Their constancy, their gumption is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. It's surely the people are grass. These people are frail, frightened, suffering perhaps even from post-traumatic stress disorder. So when the prophet arrives and says, God is coming. God is coming. Of course, like grass scorched by the hot sun of a dry summer, the people would wither. Could it be that for some, the arrival of God is not good news? Could it be for some people to hear that God is on the way is not good news? Is it possible that there are those in this world who've had such negative images of God handed to them that to proclaim the presence of God, the coming of the Almighty, is to proclaim terror and induce fear? Is it possible that there are those in our own lives who've only had these horrendous images of God given to them, images of a God who sits on a throne in the sky, watching them like some divine prison guard, waiting for them to step a, step a toe out of line to send them to hell? Is it possible that there are those among us who've only heard of a God who sets an impossibly high bar for righteousness and then just judges us for never having made it? Could it be that there are people who have only been told of a misogynistic, prejudiced, judging, all-powerful God whose only concern is that people follow his rules or else. Is it possible that there are people 
for whom the coming of God is not good news. If that's the sort of God I've heard of, I wouldn't think it's good news that he's coming. So you can see, you can see why the people of Judah might be as frail as grass. They could only recall God's judgment, God's punishment in the form of Babylon and their exile from their homeland. Of course, those of us like the prophet who know better, those of us who have experienced grace and forgiveness, who've experienced the love of God, we have an uphill climb ahead of us. We have an uphill climb before us in proclaiming the truth of just who God is. Even this time of year when it seems people's sensitivities to God and to Christ are at their most high. Because it's true, as the prophet says, the grass withers, the foul flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. There are still those among us who have been hurt by those who claim to pronounce the word of God. And there are those who simply refuse to believe because of what they see in the words and actions of others who call themselves the people of God and still others who refuse to hear because God has seemingly let them down because they've been forgotten in the unlit corners of life, where times are hard, bad luck is normal, and the wrong crowd always seems to congregate. It's not an easy task set before us. Proclaiming the arrival of God is, is surely difficult enough without the baggage of, of false claims and religious abuse of power. But it's the prophet's calling. It's our calling. Hear what, the, what God says to the prophet. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion. Herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem. Herald of good news. Lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, those who have been in exile, those who have been away, those who have experienced the absence of God, those who are wondering, where is God? Say to them, here is your God. Here is your God. While these are certainly powerful words to be spoken, they're words that undoubtedly ring hollow in the absence of conviction. For without conviction, without the lived-in testimony of a life of faith, without the truly hard work of a life lived in faithfulness, such a proclamation will be received with the same sincerity as one who shouts peace while taking aim at his enemy. Proclaiming the arrival of God is about more than just pronouncing the words. For if one is to truly hear the arrival of God as good news, one has to believe that the God who is indeed coming is indeed good. And for, one who, for those who have lived in captivity, those who have been held in the dark corners of life, those who have been handed an image of God that is anything but good, to believe in a God who is good, a God of liberation and love takes more than words. It takes our flesh and blood and bones. It takes us. It takes preparation. That's why the voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall become level. The rough places a plain. Then... Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all people shall see it together. Did you notice that? It's after everything is set right. After the valleys are lifted up, the mountains made low. After the ground is made plain. After, after it's made level. That the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all people shall see it together. It isn't after the prophet stands up and taps on the microphone. Excuse me, excuse me. Here is your God. It's after the way has been prepared, after justice has come, after reconciliation, after the great leveling. Because folks cannot hear the arrival of God as good news until the way has been prepared. They cannot hear the good news of a God who was born, lived, died, and resurrection, resurrected if that news is coming from those whose lives don't reflect some portion of the power of that truth. We can shout from the rooftops, peace on earth. 
But until we strive for reconciliation, until we've sought to understand one another, until we have truly sought to find in each other and even our enemies, our commonality of our shared humanity, we are just spitting in the wind. We can tell others that God is love. God loves you. God is love. But until we show that love to others, And not in some banal lip service sort of way, but until we really show that love to others. Until we strive to put others ahead of ourselves just as Christ himself did. Until we proclaim that love with our lives. Our words are meaningless. They're empty. And like that highway in the wilderness, we are preparing for the arrival of God. We are making the crooked places straight. We are lifting our brothers and sisters out of every valley. We are bringing the high mountains of self-righteousness down to the ground. We are making the ground level so that we may see one another as we truly are. Children of God. And together, we are striving to make the rough places plain. So that the way of the Lord will be clear. So that the arrival of our God will be one of true hope, peace, joy, and love. You and I together, along with our sisters and brothers around the world, we are all called to be a highway for our God. Making the arrival of God good news for those who might otherwise see it as anything less. You and I, we are called to make peace, to put flesh and bone to the words we proclaim about God. You and I, we are called... We are called to shout the good news of God's arrival in Christ Jesus from the mountaintop, to sing it in songs, to speak it in conversations, to tell it to whomever may listen. But above all else, you and I are called to prepare the way of the Lord through our very lives. So on this second Sunday of Advent, may the word peace be more than just a word, more than just a second candle lit on a table. May it be a reality that comes through your very hands and feet as you seek to live a life of God's peace. On this second Sunday of Advent, as we draw closer to the cradle of Christ, may the arrival of Jesus' birth be more than just a holiday on the calendar, more than just a passing season, more than just a time to drag out the tree and put it back up. May it be the truth that shapes each day of your life. The truth that I pray is reflected in every one of us in the love that we have for God and for one another. May we all be a highway for our Lord. May we all prepare for his coming. And in that preparation, may others see in us his arrival as truly good news. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, Lord, help us to be highways for you, to prepare the way, God, for your arrival, that our lives may reflect our conviction and our love for God and for each other so that when we proclaim with our words and with our mouths the good news of your arrival and for all who know us it may in fact be good news help us God to take the truth of your arrival the good news for us deep into our hearts to live by it each day not only in this season but in every day before and hereafter And holy God, convict us. Help us, Lord, to not only talk the talk, but God, to walk your walk. So Holy Spirit, move in our presence now. Help us, Lord, to make whatever decisions, whatever moves we need to make. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.